Very good. Morena, welcome to the community board meeting. Uh, it's just gone 10 a.m., uh, 22nd of August. And Cody, would you like to start proceedings off with a, a karakia? In good time. In good time. Yeah. Um, te maranau. Kia whakapapa whaunamu te mawana. Ai horahi mā tātou i te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai. Tātou e e tātou katoa. Muye tai e. Thank you, Cody, for that. So, welcome to the meeting, everyone. Welcome to a number of staff uh, that are here this morning. Media, good to see you, Marjorie. Thank you. Oh, Media as well. Thanks for coming along. And uh, uh, Julie will be hearing from you soon. So, welcome to you as well. Uh, Ken Bailey, Ken, uh, good to have you on the hot seat. Ken, General Manager of Community Services. Thanks for joining us. Um, and particularly apt, considering the agenda and uh, being quite community services centric. Uh, Quentin, thank you for coming along. Quentin, as we know, is uh, not part of the community board, but is an integral part of some of the discussions we have. The meeting is being recorded as we speak, so please be aware of that. Um, Linda has, uh, we've got a, an apology received from Linda uh, for some family matters that are happening for her. So, uh, yeah, Linda is an apology. Just ask if there's any leaves of absence requests uh, over the next six weeks or so. 28th of September to 5th of October. Yeah, September to 5th of October, day before my birthday. I'm pleased you're coming back for that. Anyone else? Put in my door. Uh, yeah. Bring the cake. Yeah, gluten free. <laughs> 27th of September to the 6th of October. Very. I'll leave you away. We'll note that. Anyone else? Very good. Okay, uh, so I will move that uh, Linda's apology and the two leaves uh, of absence request be approved. Anyone like to second that? Cody sticking that. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Carried. Uh, any conflicts of interest that anyone wants to note uh, per the agenda uh, today? Anything that's uh, any conflict? So it sounds good. There's no matters lying on the table. And there's no oh. registrations for public forum, but we do have a deputation and Julie from the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust. Welcome, Yura. Love to hear you. Thanks for the great work. And I haven't been prepped so or briefed, so I have no idea what you're going to speak to us about. So what was that? Sorry, did I miss sorry. Well, thank you for having me. And I just thought I'd give you a bit of an update on the housing trust and what we're up to in the Upper Perth area. Great. I did see an article in the ODT probably back in February about the community board um, discussing affordable housing and even thinking about consulting on it. So I just thought I'd bring you up to speed on what we're up to. So we currently have around 50 properties um, under uh, different 10 years and programs in the Wanaka area. Uh, we've just finished a 28 lot development in Longview and we've got still another 30 sections to come to us there. We're in the design phase of around 20 at the moment and we'll roll them out over the next year or so. Um, we're building two homes in Mount Katrina Station. Uh, we've got another six sections to come there from the developer through the inclusionary housing process. We are finishing four homes in Hikawai at the moment. Um, we've already built six there. Again, through it. most of this is through inclusionary housing. Um, there's also some stakeholder deeds that council has with uh, Mr. Dippy and the three, the wider three parks area, um, areas around three parks. So at some stage, they will eventuate into contributions to the trust. Um, hopefully, they'll look more a bit medium density, a bit a bit higher density than the more traditional low density housing that we build. Um, we're big fans of density. I think that ultimately it's the only way to really get get the numbers up and help the people. We've got currently around 235 Wanaka-based households on our database today. Um, so that number is growing all the time. <coughs> it makes up about nearly 20% of our total port, uh, waiting list. So it's definitely smaller than the Queenstown side, but there is a lot of stock coming on, so that's helpful. Um, about... Uh, probably about, at the moment, 15 households in the Wanaka area are seniors, so 65 plus. And of course, we can see the pipeline of that growing as well. We've got the hearing coming up with council for that transfer of the Pechner Cottages down on McDougall Street across to us. We own the empty section at 
I think it's number 45 McDougall Street, and the plan there is to build a, um, redevelop that whole site and get some more, you know, at least 12 homes, if not more. Um, <clears throat> at this stage, we're talking about one bed is for senior housing specifically, um, and if there's, you know, an opportunity to increase density there, we certainly will. Um, I'm also on a steering committee, along with a few others, for uh, developing an Abbey Field House in Wanaka. So it's been driven by local lady Stephanie Fieldson. We are looking for a treasurer. And so if you know anyone who's looking to get into a governance role, they have a finance background, please do send them our way because, um, yeah, we're really serious about getting there. Obviously, it's not related to the Community Housing Trust, but we see it as very complementary to what we do. It's quite a different model. It's essentially um, a big house and it's a flatting setup for seniors um, and it provides really nice social um, services as well as they get their own room and bathroom, etc. So, yeah, I just want to give you an update on what we're up to and happy to take any questions that you might have. I make one comment. Um, you're, well, the housing trust itself, but you're particularly a come up in conversation very often in that it's um, seen as a really positive thing that's been offered in the region. And um, there's people that I know, there's friends of mine who've actually got houses through the US and I think the reason you've got such a long waiting list is that you're so popular and so well known and, and providing the service that these guys need. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. I think Chris, the waiting list is Chris. long. Chris, sorry. I think the waiting list is long because um, because of yeah the need, but it's nice. Yeah, I think it's but they know that it works yes. as well. And yeah, I think that's what happens. A, that's true. Well, yes, but yeah, yeah, thank you. We, 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 the we the face of uh, community our ex housing trust is based at you. Can you just expand a little bit on the team you've got under you that's doing all this? Yes, happy to because really do have a good team. There's we are five FTE now, six staff. Um, five of us are based in Queenstown, and we have one uh, Emma Roberts over here in Wanaka. So we have um, Emma and another one in Queenstown are tenancy managers, so they take care of all our households. We have currently about 160 properties across the district, um, and they also deal with the new ones coming on board and assessing them and allocating the homes that we've got under construction. Um, and then we also have Karina, who's been with me about eight years, housing service manager, and then we have two in the sort of development side. So Trish, um, she was project manager at the airport. She's our development design manager. And we've just taken on a sustainability and development officer, um, which is great, Arthur Lee. He's in his 20s, he's male. And so he's um, bringing some diversity <laughs> to otherwise mid 40s females um, staffing. But um, he's really great. He's going to be really pushing us in the areas of sustainability, building better homes. We already build well above code, um, but we want to be building better, 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 and um, at the same time trying to make it affordable for us to deliver that product. So he's going to help us in that respect, and also as an organisation. So, so, um, so when you're like, well, you obviously have a project office on them. Who, who does the negotiation with the, the builders and developers to get it all done? Um, so we we will discuss it probably if it, in terms of the construction side of it as a within the development team. So Trish, myself and Arthur, and then we have a property committee with the from our board. So we've got um, Brad McClay, who's Queenstown based, runs a property group, he's the chair, and Phil Smith, who's obviously Wanaka based, and we will run things past them and then we'll take it to the board, board for sign off. Brilliant. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight, I suppose, the importance of universal design and providing for people with disabilities for, in the affordable and social housing sector. Um, yeah, and, and that that's really important. I know that you've made some efforts at Job Street, um, Job Street, sorry, in Arrowtown, and a percentage of those. Um, and I suppose that you know the Olympics is a great example. They build the Olympic Village. And that also has to work for the Paralympics following. Um, and so a huge proportion of that is universal design. So, um, yeah, just to push that route that, it, that it's a sector that often misses out. It often is on fixed income or, or challenging circumstances. And it's really important that they've got the opportunity and the options available. Yeah, absolutely. We have a policy around that, obviously, but we're typically trying to 
we see a need growing as well, particularly with the seniors coming through. So a good, I would say, typically 20% of our new homes we build these days um, across the board on average are fully accessible or accessible ready. Yeah. Where's the next wave of um, land going to come from for you to sort of make a, a meaningful dip into that 230 waiting list? Yeah, um, probably that three parks area, um, Orchard Road, around that side side of things and unless we find a piece of land ourselves to purchase at um so that you know it would need to be in some form below market uh, to make the numbers stack up for us and, yeah coming to the end julie um you've got a great brand we really appreciate the work that's been doing we appreciate the fact that you you, you know you're very open and to partnering with other entities and stuff particularly you know we talk about every field etc <laughs> um, follow this with real interest and uh, thanks for coming along and sharing Thank these you. insights with us, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to confirming the agenda, uh, is there anyone got any alterations to the agenda? Okay, well, I'll move then that uh, the current uh, agenda be adopted without addition or alteration. You want to second that? John Wellington, all those in favour? Aye. I'll carry that. Minutes. The last meeting was on the 11th of July. Uh, has anyone uh, got any edits or changes they'd like to see to those minutes? Uh, would, you, uh, well, would you like to move the minutes from the 11th of July be confirmed as true and correct? Yes, I'll move, Mr. Chair. And John will second that as well. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Carried. Great. Well, it's been a while coming, but we're really excited to. Um, mm -hmm. Have Kat come up and join us. Kat, are you going to have anyone else there to talk about the draft Mount Iron Reserve Management Plan? Huge piece of work. Something with the, uh, oh, we're getting triple T. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, this is, uh, we've been, I'd say the community board's been mostly involved. We've had a couple of workshops around this, and I think, well, uh, the amount of work that Christine's done, and maybe the team is going back and you know, it was really complex at the start, so to still it down into this draft RMP is really impressive. And thank you for uh, genuinely listening to our uh, insights and concerns or observations and taking them on board. It's, uh, it's been really uh, a very collaborative working relationship, so thank you. Before we open up the floor, Kat, is there anything you'd like to add to uh, the discussion before questions? Uh, yes, if that's possible. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge Christine, who, as you said, has done a lot of the planning work. Unfortunately, she's not available to be here today, um, but I am joined by Bri and Dave, who can also support. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo what you're saying, that this is a really important milestone today to have got to this draft RMP is a really important next step. Um, you know, for us reaching a final reserve management plan that will provide that kind of agreed vision for what the future of Mount Iron will be. Um, and just to say that the draft reserve management plan really reflects what we've heard from Mana Whenua and the community. Um, you know, Mana Whenua have spent a significant amount of time inputting and ensuring that those Kaitahu values are included in this report. Um, and also, you know, the extensive engagement that we did with the community is really reflected in here. And we had some really great feedback about the way that we'd engaged. I just wanted to reflect on the amount of engagement that we got as well, you know, that we had over 60 people attend workshops. We had over 600 contributors add pins to an online map about what they wanted to see on Mount Iron. So we did receive a lot of feedback. Um, and there was a real range in some areas as well of what people were wanting, and that's created some challenges in terms of what's gone into this draft reserve management plan. Um, but we're really happy with where it's landed in terms of the, you know, the community's draft vision and objectives and how those policies will achieve that. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that since the last community board workshop, um, the real changes have been in relation to the inclusion of the Manafuna values and working with them um, and that that work is still ongoing and we're expecting um, some more additions from them. Um, and just lastly to say this is still the draft. Um, so once it's gone to council, if that's approved, it will go out for consultation and there'll be the opportunity for everyone to submit um, and hopefully, you know, move towards 
an even better reserve management plan and that will obviously come back to this community board prior to being finalised. Yeah, that's all from me. Well, well, well uh, set up for discussion. Thank you, Yola. Thank you, Kat. Uh, open up to the team to uh, for any comments or questions. Uh, Cody, just, Cody first and then Quentin. Um, I just wanted to commend you on the early engagement summary just because I think it's a really great intention for closing the loop. Often um, when people consult, they tend to, you know, whether or not they find the right avenue to hear back, but I just think it's really great that um, it's well captured of what you've got and people get a chance to see what everyone else has said. It just feels like a really important part of the process that, um, yeah, it's done really well on this. So I just wanted to commend you on that. Thank you. Um, firstly, I understand that the Kaitahu or iwi engagement was only really received quite recently and following our previous workshop. So I suppose if you could just outline the changes or what the feedback was in general from iwi on the plan and what changes were made following that work. Yeah, most of it has really been um, the visibility of their values. So you'll see, especially in that front section, um, pulling those through from where they've been shared in terms of other documents and processes as well. Um, and I guess giving more visibility in the wording through a lot of the objectives and um, policies about also that protection of cultural values, as well as like, the ecological and the um, historical as well. Um, and also um, there's a bit of a rewording of an objective in terms of ensuring Manafenua decision making in terms of their values and how the reserve is managed. So those are probably the big ones. Was there any attempt to record the values or the sites of significance on in the plan? Yes, yeah, so some of that work is ongoing, um, and that's why um, potentially the opportunity for them to include more um, because that's still an ongoing discussion. I suppose the one of the reasons, and it's, it's great that we had that engagement. That just that if six six seven point seven point ten says ensure trail planning building avoids areas identified by Kaitahu Kenawa as having cultural value, it's just unclear whether they're specific sites or whether they're large areas of the reserve, and that it is quite significant to the application of that policy given that it's, it says avoid them, <laughs> not 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 mitigate or manage or, or anything. So, yeah, just wanting a little bit more clarity around that through the process as to what values and areas they are identified in that way. Um, so I guess they haven't identified specific areas at the moment, um, but they're still working on that. So then there may be some that come. And I guess we're just wanting to allow, um, allow for that to then be incorporated into the plan. And I guess, yeah, you're right, that would then input into how those policies were interpreted and applied. Um, I suppose you can yeah. see that if, if, if they identified the whole of the reserve of, as having cultural value, that would eliminate any opportunity for those other activities. Yeah, under the wording of that. So, can you, I wonder whether is there any wording you can suggest that? Yeah, I, mean, to look yeah. At, yeah, I guess um, they haven't provided any detail at the moment. So, yeah. the, the, the draft reflects this, all the information that we've got at the moment. And I guess what we're also saying is still just a draft. So, we still have that part of that community feedback that we still need to receive. <laughs> And just sorry, one more question. Oh, sorry, but I do understand what you're, what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, just trying to yeah, bring that up, just because it, it did happen late in the piece, so we didn't have the visibility of those. Um, the other is that on the when we previously had seen the map, um, it included a notation around the access um, access way at Little Mount Iron. So there's secondary to the Hidden Hills one, there's another driveway effectively that is public land and that had a notation on it saying, um, you know, there was potential for walking and cycling access there. Um, that doesn't appear on the map now. I wonder how we could address that. Yeah, so we're having some ongoing discussions with the neighbours about that access way, but we're happy to add it in to the draft if that is 
the preference of the board? Um, from my perspective, it's important that it is there for those that specifically for that reason, because it, it might be an area of contention that it needs to be there so people can submit on it, either support or oppose it, and that um, an appropriate guidance can be given in the, the final document around that. Um, so is it your recommendation now that we do include that on the map and that change will be made if the plans are approved for consultation today? We're happy to make that change, and then, as you say, it can it can go out for consultation. Okay. Yeah. So this was the walking from Orby Road to come into the sort of the base of Little Mount High, and that yep. walkway through there. Yeah. It's a little bit disappointing that it's been left out because that has been strongly that this. My understanding that this has always been included as a possible access point. Yeah. So it would be good to have it back in, so it can be deliberated. So no change to point on the map, and it would should, should say, and I don't know the specific name, but a you know um, access point brackets walking and cycling or something like that um, is appropriate. I don't not suggesting we put vehicles up there at all, but um, that walking and cycling should be at least part of the consultation. So we're happy to take the advice of the board and add that to the map, particularly if it gets better consultation. Yeah, I was just going to support, but I think it's really important that we identify. All public access where it exists, whether we promote it or not, is another issue. But we need to identify it and mark it so that those who who, who wish to use it can. Uh, if if it is contentious, then we may choose not to promote it, but it, it does need to be identified. Happy to do that. Uh, <coughs> see if I don't. <laughs> yeah. Regina, just following on from what Quentin raised, then if we're making that change, which I agree with that change, but. Can we also consider making the wording change at 6, 7, 10, that the word avoids, is like Quentin has pointed out, is very strong. And with, un, with not knowing uh, what's coming, you know, words to the effect like, instead of avoids, like take account of areas of identified by Guy Tahu. If we're going to, uh, that's what I think, I think he, uh, Quentin's highlighted a pretty important point there. And with us not knowing exactly the extent of what the cultural areas may be, uh, we shouldn't put ourselves in a position of uh, uh, not enabling some further ability to address the whole of the reserve based on what they come back with. I support a word to change there. Inca, yeah, that was a conversation that I had with you once I'd read the paper to get some clarity around that. It's feeling a little bit of exposure going through this process that there is an overriding unknown at the moment where there is a, there's just no visibility at all as to what is a culturally significant part of the manga at the moment. And it, 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 is that huge, you know, I use the word huge swathes or is it small thing, you know, is it, is it based, what's the basis for it? And what is the timing for that to be identified as opposed to leaving it open for any, um, you know, any classification of that anywhere down the track. So, so this is unknown at the moment, but as we said, this is a draft and it will yeah. come back through. Well, we won't have that information right now, but it will come back through the hearings process and the board to um, adopt the... So do we have assurance from staff that any areas of cultural significance to Manifenoa, which is really important and really support, is actually identified before the RMP is formally signed on? Um, yes, we will have that information in the draft that will be brought to the board to recommend to council that it be adopted. At that stage, it will be the final do document, and that's where then the board can comment on on that. And that should be clear at that stage in yeah. the process. Well, that should as we are. Will we'll be, we'll we'll be clear? Yeah. 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 Because I think that's fine, because yeah. we know that we are, you know, this is really valuable in what we're getting, and we know the timing mm -hmm. hasn't been quite in, as in sync, but that's all good. But when we need to make sure that all parties understand that when we go to finally sign this off after consultation, that we can't have this general sort of unknown in the RMP. We will have to have sites of cultural significance having been identified. identified. And, and I, I suppose just to learn from experience with the Waihi Tuna in the district plan, for instance, is that well, firstly to acknowledge that Mount Iron wasn't identified in the Waihi Tuna chapter of the district plan, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, so that they didn't have any specific um, 
lacking to parental values that they assign to that. But secondly, that um, it's easy to map large areas and say there might be something in there, but we really need some more certainty around what those values or, or those sites are in order to manage those effectively and, and, and not put an undue onus on projects to you know, provide additional assessments and things like that to, to demonstrate. So, yeah. And then just through you, Chair, uh, picking up on the point that you've outlined is that um, we've obviously outlined at the start through CAP a program of work taking us through the council, et cetera, but you've been very clear as a board and yourself as a chair about making sure this aspect was identified and um, clarified before we get to a point of sign-off. Absolutely. So that could have to no change in the mediation adjustment. Uh, yeah, through the chair, I understood that uh, because uh, these further discussions were imminent that you wanted an addition to the recommendation that would provide authority to the board to um, sign it off before the public notification. If that's possible, that would be ideal because it allows several more weeks for input um, and then the board sign off prior to it going out for consultation. Okay, it's probably because... safer to do that through the chair of the board just in terms of a, a draft recommendation has been included in the run of meeting that is doesn't appear in the published agenda, and um, and I was going to note I was going to note that when we move to the recommendation, so uh, when we move to the motion, sorry. Uh, yeah, I I just wondered if you wanted to. Um, indicate what, what the text is. Just... Okay. So let me share with that. I, I think there was an understanding as we were up against some time constraints coming into the meeting that we wanted to have a little bit more flexibility with getting Manahunua feedback. Um, I wasn't comfortable with that just being accepted by staff, so I wanted it to come back through the community board and for us to have sign-off uh, on that. We understood that that wasn't going to be pragmatic to have another meeting, so we were going to do that by email. So the way it reads at the moment, which will be part of the motion, is agree that the community board undertake final sign-off via email of the draft Mount Iron Reserve Management Plan prior to public notification to accommodate requests from Mana Whenua for additional contextual information and any other changes. So I think it's limited down to the Mana Whenua feedback. It allows us to, uh, to look at that and to accept that it is still within the domain of the staff, uh, with the domain of the community board to accept that before going out to public consultation. I suggest it's, that's for every way to deal with the mapping change too. You just spend my panel and mapping. Okay, very good. I'll add that as well. And mapping changes. Just going to close off that section of the discussion. Is everyone comfortable with that? Okay, so I'm going to reopen it back up. Does anyone else got any other questions or observations for the team? I've got probably just. Um, there is some movement on the location and design of the uh, Great Ride coming into, into Wanaka. Um, I think the way that everything is drafted, that won't be a problem. It will fit within this, this reserve management plan. I just wanted to highlight that that's looking to be the, the preferred route. I expect they'll be able to make a submission that yes. informs that, yeah. which will be useful. Yeah. I don't think it'll materially. No, the location of the trail. It, 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 it'll use the, the plan is to use most of the existing track and possibly upgrade it just around the base of Mount Iron for possible small connection through to um, the Mount Iron Junction. Yeah, I think the draft has got yeah, the yeah, it looks like it covers it, but I just wanted to raise it. That's looking to be the route, preferred route. Yeah, can I just uh, move on to once this is. Uh, Passed today, if that's what the board decides, and then goes to uh, council for ratification or for signing off. Then we go to consultation. Can you just give me a sense as to the consultation actually being a little bit prescriptive about that? Uh, is it going to be an open question going, do you agree with the RMP or not? Yes, no, and then put comments. Are you going to want feedback on specifically identified areas? Are you going to go through section by section and ask for feedback? Where are we going to get that balance between not making it arduous? But not making it so blanket. It's it's you know. Do you have you given thought to that yet? Uh, yeah. So at the moment we're thinking 
start with probably as a general do you support or not um, and then potentially um, some questions that kind of cover the key topics and then a you know, is there anything else that people would want to comment on? So that's kind of our thinking at the moment, but happy to take any thoughts if you guys feel strongly about things we should touch on in the engagement. No, I, I just want to get that balance right between it not just being a blanket, do you support this and any other comments, but neither going through. And I've seen when we're trying to get, you know, there, there has been consultation fatigue in the community. I think we're not too bad at the moment. There hasn't been a lot of consultation. There was a period two or three years ago where it was all on. So I think just getting that balance is getting some meaningful back, but not making it so that a member of the public goes and sort of goes, oh, you know, how many questions am I going to get answered? So I just asked for some pragmatism there around around that. I need to take that thought on board. Yeah. Yeah. And we, yeah, and we, I suppose we have to be careful about those things that we specifically identify because then we're high, you know, this is very complex. There's a lot on here and we could consult on. 150 different aspects of it. So we just have to be careful about those ones that we do consult on that we're not sort of signaling that, you know, is this contentious or by by even elevating it, putting it into an area where it, you know what I'm saying? We just have to be really balanced there as to the areas that if you do pull out areas to consult on, there must be genuine uh, need for getting specific public feedback on. Yeah, and I think that we would just be more focused on perhaps where we got a real range of community feedback, you know, where we've landed in a specific place here, but we heard a real variety of views to understand if perhaps we have landed in the right place Definitely. for the community. And I think that was the real advantage of doing that pin and drop. We've got all that really rich data right at the start. I think that's really set this up well, you know, encouraging staff to take that same approach with the... Um, Wanaka Airport master plan <laughs> is I think there was been a real precedent here set of sort of galvanizing everyone seeing where the hot points are and then going into deeper consultation so we've got some good data there okay we're good okay so I'm just going to talk through this that uh the motion will be that actually one other thing we need to do we might need to hold a hearings panel um, because if people submit and want to be heard, we will constitute that panel with three members of the community board. And we reflected and got some guidance from uh, the democracy team that suggested uh, Councillor Bruce, Councillor Cox and community board member Chris Hadfield be uh, the three individuals on that hearing panel. Has so anyone got any observations or uh, any thoughts of the contrary around that? Fantastic. Okay, so the motion will be that we note the contents of the report, that we recommend to council that the draft management plan be uh, be notified, uh, that we approve um, Barry, Lyle and Chris to be on the hearings panel, and that we agree that the Wanaka Upper Perth Community Board undertake final sign-off uh, via email of the draft Mount Iron Reserve Management Plan prior to public notification to accommodate requests from Mana Whenua and any mapping changes for additional contextual information and any other changes. <coughs> anyone would like to move that motion? John, anyone would like to second that? Cody, all those in favour? Uh, there is all, two votes. Oh, sorry, sorry. Before sorry, I put that to the vote. Oh, yeah, there's one of the clarification. I'm just to understand how this works. So mm -hmm. from Jane or from the staff about, we've got it going to council for in, uh, in recommendation two, and then recommendation four is saying we've got to sign off on any changes. So that, I assume that's before it goes yes. to council. Yeah, I think we've got that window between now and the, when is the council meeting that this will be presented? Mm -hmm. So we've got between now. So we've effectively got just under a month before it goes to council to make those changes. Okay, but, so, so that's my understanding. Sorry, just from government. That, so this will. Go on to the council agenda, what, uh, and it won't won't wait till all this has been done before because we might miss the time frame for a council agenda. So you, yes, yeah, it will be managed through the chief executive's report. Uh, so oh, it's yeah, a recommendation yeah, yeah, yeah. coming through. Um, so I will need to liaise with the um, the uh, staff in parks okay. and reserves to make okay. sure that that our timings do okay. correspond. 
So you're right, that any any addition, any changes or anything that we sanction up before it gets into the order of papers for for the council meeting on the 19th of September. So it's about a th two and a half weeks. Oh, sorry, I'm not questioning it, but as Mana Firma, you're, you're confident you'll get that in place. Oh, yeah. So they're very aware of the time frames, mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to hold it up. I'm, no, no, no. Um, they will either input something prior to that time, right. um, or you know, then they're also welcome to submit in the same way as anyone else when the plan goes out. Okay, thanks, Mr. So I put the motion. It remains unchanged. It was uh, you know, John put the motion. It was seconded by Cody. Uh, the motion is unchanged. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? Let's carry that. So thank you very much. Well done, team. Yeah, and I think we took some time because this is really important to us. This is a really intergenerational thing. We need to get it right, and you guys are right on, on top of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Second item uh, on the substantive part of the agenda is to uh, approve the Upper Kutha AMP Society's uh, desire to undertake alterations on the building within the uh, showgrounds within the Micro Recreation Reserve. And Matt, good to see you again. Thank you for coming along. And Brianna again. Uh, anything you guys would like to add to the paper already put? Great. It's got some questions around this particular uh, request for uh, alteration. I'll move this Okay. Anyone else got any comments? Looks good. Everyone yeah. happy? So, We've yeah. put it before. Okay. So, I move, Mr. Chair. thank you very much. Well, I was moving to note the comments of the report and recommend to council to grant minister's approval under the, the minister's delegation for the planned alterations of the AMP building. Barry would like to second that. All those in favour? Aye. No against. Carried. Excellent. Thank you, team. We'll keep you guys in the hot seat there because the tennis club uh, has asked for uh, approval of a, a new lease, which has come to us before, and we had uh, members of the tennis club present to us at a public forum, which was great. Um, can you just confirm, Matt, if you can remember why it's come back to us again, what's happened in the interim between last time and now? Um, I believe last time the report was for notification. Yes. It's since been publicly notified, right. and so now it's just the approval of that lease. <coughs> My understanding there was a here, there was no one, there was no submissions, so, so the community seemed to be comfortable with that. I'll just throw that open to everyone to ask anything further. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just, um, just a bit of a clarification on, sorry, tying it in with the policy. Uh, it, it, I understand it comes under the policy a dollar for up to 10,000 square metres, and then uh, thereafter, 0.018 dollars per metre. Yeah. I'm just trying to compare it with some of the other leases we've got. Now, I understand rugby club, you only a small area A and B, that must be a dollar, isn't it? Yeah. Um, some of the bigger ones, dare I say it, like the golf club, they come under that, theirs is bigger because they get charged for the extra, a lot, lot more land. That, that they are separate, they don't fall under the CFFP. Oh, they're, they're, on a, they're on a separate agreement. Okay. Um, so, what about you know, be careful, so the, for example, the rodeo club? It's got a lease on a bit of land. Uh, and does it, does it come under a different policy, too? I'm not sure with the rodeo. I'm just trying to understand the, yeah. the dollar, dollar side of it versus, yeah. Um, we did raise this last time that it is a substantial piece of council asset that the tennis club does charge membership fees, coaching fees, and green, you know, casual play, which uh, uh, the community gets in return for that uh, a dollar a year if charged. We know that falls under a different policy around community services. Just as a sideline conversation, are we rethinking the way that we approach that uh, charging of clubs for use of council assets? Yeah, so like the tennis club themselves, all the assets are, bought, are owned by the tennis club. So the land, land is an asset. The is. land is owned by us. Mm -hmm. So in this situation, we're renting them the land yes. for a dollar under that CFFP. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows for that the CFFP. So unless there's any substantial changes to that, we would continue to charge them under that policy. Um, it 
it is a bit different when council owns the buildings or owns the facilities as well. But we're just the situation we're in. More well, they're distinctly commercial in nature. Correct. And there's the seven and a half percent or the five percent for in the case actually of the golf courses, it's one percent of gross asset is typically how some of them were traditionally, which was an old style and it's not yeah, but most of the current ones are either five percent or seven and a half percent of commercial revenue turnover. So, so through the chair, if there were changes to the policy, then that could be reflected yeah. through the next yeah, document would, would be, in yeah. future. Mm -hmm. But just, at the moment, just um, fair to be a point here, yeah, quite fortunate in this district with the amount of use that our assets get. But mm -hmm. in some districts, you will see where clubs are falling over that um, yeah. they are changing and possibly been applied to different thinking, as you've rightly pointed out. And, and as um, Councillor Smith's pointed out, um, certain commercial activity mm -hmm. outright is looked at in a different way. Um, what we see there is community based engagement. So we'll just get back to the matter at hand, which is which is which is important, which is the lease that's been a uh, thirty year lease. So, is any other questions or comments around this before we approve uh, or recommend that this go forward? Okay, so very good. So. So it certainly is a well-run club, and it certainly is uh, very uh, fortunate that to, to have the, the club as part of the community. Would anyone like to move that uh, that we recommend to council that this new lease be granted for the tennis club? Very would love to move that. Chris is going to second that. Any other conversation? Any other comments? Rise. I'll put that. All those in favour? Aye. Uh, anyone against? Very good. Thanks, team. We'll uh, move that on to council to, uh, to, to recommend that new lease is granted. Um, number four on the agenda is an environmental monitoring station. Uh, we've seen some of the images there. Uh, it's not too far from the tennis court, is it, Matt? Yeah, it's on the same reserve. It's on the same reserve there. Yeah. To set the scene for us as to what we're hoping to achieve here by granting this. This lease. So this is a request from Otago Regional Council to monitor the air quality. And so they're trying to set up a network of air quality monitoring stations, um, monitoring particle matter within the air within each individual district. So they currently have one in Arrowtown. They're in the process. They have a temporary one set up in Frankton at the moment. They would like one here in Wanaka. And they're also looking at a temporary one in the other town for the near future as well. So setting up a network to monitor that air quality. Right. And we're providing uh, the space for them the land for them to put that and then to fence it off like we saw the one at Parirua. It'll yep. be very similar to that. So it looks like a weather station. With the... Yep. So as well as monitoring air quality, if they can monitor additional environmental features, it gives them better data. So, you know, measuring wind and temperature and humidity and everything else then provides better data in terms of air quality. So being able to monitor more variables gives them better quality data, which is what we're seeking. Um, Anyone are going to have any comments they'd like to make, Quentin? Um, oh, just to query with other sites, I mean, I'm not opposed to it at all, but are there other sites that were considered that might have been more appropriate or um, was that what they wanted? They've, they've been looking for sites for quite some time. Um, it's been identified by the air quality scientists that this is one of the best locations in terms of this area due to the elevation and the location within the community. So it gets an accurate reading of air quality. Um, so within those variables, there are limited sites where it would be appropriate. And that's where they're obviously yes, happy. Yes, we have looked at alternative sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. that's cool. Well, I'm going to come in we might well put it there because we've got two cell phone towers sites that we all have. And the people on the other side of the road aren't complaining. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Brocade, they don't seem to be happy with it. They, yeah. they get their pa paddock for a dollar. So, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. So, as a community benefit, and you know, that longitudinal study as to air quality really, really important for us. So, I think we could play a part. So I'm happy to move uh, that the contents of this report be noted and that uh, the, the lease be granted. Um, goodness, we need to appoint three Upper Clutha community board members to a hearing panel. Yes, so just in case. Just in case. Yeah. I'll be happy to be on that. Let's get three different people. Anyone else would like to be on the air quality uh, or on this, if there's a hearing panel required? Cody. John and Simon, just to mix it up a little bit, please. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. 
take some put money on it, you won't get called up. Yeah. Oh, maybe why we put your name through. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this the first time that we've ever had a hearing panel that Kyle hasn't been on it? Shall we make this <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good. You give your time now. Okay. Um, I'm moving this recommendation. I'm moving this motion that we adopt the, the report. Uh, that we point John, Cody, and Simon to a hearings panel if needed. Uh, anyone like to second that? I'll second it. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Uh, anyone against? Great. Awesome. Thanks, team. OIC will be happy and uh, thank you for your work on that. Um, Come. Just in time. And you're coming up to. Uh, good morning, Kim. You're coming up to brief us on this license to occupy at Wanaka Mount Aspiring Road to put the underpass under for the golf course. Yeah. Do you want to set the scene at all, or are you comfortable that the paper speaks for it? I would say there's no additional information. Right. John. So I've got a question. The, um, the advantages are to provide a safer crossing point. Can you confirm who the users will be? Users will be the golf course and any of the patrons of the golf course themselves. Okay, I have some concerns about this because if you look at the um, environment court's decision on that site, the as part of the original application and also as part of the uh, environment court decision, the underpass was also to serve the walking and cycling track that was being created. I do, I did see that. Um, however, that's related to the resource consent itself, which is slightly separate to the LTO. So I can only condition it based on the portion of road reserve that they are requesting. Um, the users and that, and that side of who might extend on beyond that is is under the resource and engineering acceptance side of things. Well, I have real difficulty supporting this if it's not meeting the terms of the environment court decision. The either if it, if it if they need an underpass to provide safe crossing for the golf users, that same requirement surely applies to the walkers and cyclists of a thing that they volunteered as part of the consent. Yeah. Um, I can add um, an additional condition to cover that. I know that they've got quite a few at the very start, um, but I'm more than happy to add an additional condition that would state that they follow through with the Environment Court recommendations under their consent, if you'd like. Oh, please. I, I do see that they've moved the location, uh, but at the moment, the walking and cycling track, when it's built, is going to just dump people onto the road with no parking, um, relatively close to a corner where vehicles are moving up to 80 or 100 kilometres an hour. I don't think that's a good outcome. I think it goes against the whole principle of the decision that the environment court made. I think it's really important that we cover that off. I looked at the underpass and where it was located, and is there an intention at the moment it doesn't I mean it's just paddocks either side so is there an intention at some stage for that to be brought into the broader uh, recreation network john uh yeah the, this, these tracks are, are being constructed currently as part of the, the condition is that they have to be constructed in the first and second stage of development okay. and they will be taken over by council and maintained by council after a suitable period but at the moment i don't think that meets a safety concern when the Part of the selling point of this was there would be an underpass for the walkers and cyclists. It was going to be a combined one. They were going to be the resource consent and environment court decision included two underpasses, and it looks like they've moved it potentially to have one. But I think it's really important that at the very least we apply the condition that that it's not just for the users; it has to be available for the cycle track as well, the public as well. It's fine. I can definitely deal with the. Um engineer that's working on that resource consent and ensure that we get an appropriate condition to cover that for you. Is that part of, would that change though, the license to occupy, can we put that condition on this license to occupy? It would be so that the same conditions that are in the license to occupy itself, and um, it would be a variation to suit the license to occupy portion while allowing them to follow through. So um, if they don't meet the conditions within the license to occupy itself, then it becomes void. And then obviously it leads into their EA and resource consent side of conditions, which require an LTO. So they would have to come to a, they've got to meet their conditions with the license to occupy, which has separate conditions again. I don't understand that. But my <laughs> question is, do we need to change the wording that we are about to, um, to vote on? Uh, I would add an additional one. So I would 
go and so speak to the resource consent engineer and just combine an additional one um, on here, which I can send back through to you guys. So that would mean we wouldn't be passing this at the moment. We'd have to come back to another meeting. Could we do a subject to, to, to the chair's approval? Yeah, I can send that through to you. Just, I'd like to discuss it with the resource consent engineer just to make sure that we've okay. got the appropriate wording in there. So I'm going to make it subject to chair's approval that, give me the wording, could you help me with the wording? Can you oh, I, I wouldn't be 100% because I'm not sure on the resource. On, well, what am I going to, do? subject to chair's approval that the court decision, the decision was upheld. Intent of the court decision around walking and biking use of the underpass is upheld. Yep. Stepping back, does anyone else have questions or for come or observations around this request for a license to occupy? Do we get a sense of left a little bit vague? You know, this is going to be the last time I think this happened was on the way to Cromwell when the uh, the farmer put the underpass in there, and then there was that road that went round. The for, whole road for construction? Mm, the whole road. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, you know, it's quite meaningful. I mean, it was particularly on that, that sort of reasonably well trafficked. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how long do we think that this whole road, meaning into the paddock over, you know, back round again, will be in place for? Uh, for the duration of construction is what I've been informed of, but that also falls under the engineering acceptance side of mm -hmm. the vetting process, which I know is still being vetted. And um, so that will depend with P and I and the engineering acceptance. So we are granting license to occupy with it with, with at the moment without any real visibility into the length of time that the road or the network will be compromised. At the moment, I don't have a deadline for their construction, so I don't have a um, a start and beginning date. I just know that they have to meet this as a part of their two other consents in order for them to get that signed off before they can process forward. Is there anything else regarding this that will be coming back to the community board for sign off, or this is the license to occupy is the only aspect that we will be? As far as I'm aware. Well, Mr. Chair, I guess if they, if they want to stop the road, they'll have to come back to the community. Mm -hmm. And for me, not for construction. Mm -hmm. That's traffic management. That's oh, okay, traffic management. Yeah. They'll do the right stop. Do it the same as well. Any other comments? No. Okay. So, you know, um, we're not going to be sticklers here. So, we're going to, someone will move that we note the contents of the report that we grant a license to occupy. The legal road reserved to enable the underpass to be installed or constructed, and that they're subject to chair's approval. This is all subject to chair's approval that the intent of the environment court decision around walking and biking use of the underpass is upheld. Would anyone like to move that? Barry's moving that. Anyone like to second that? Uh, three way tie, Chris. All those in favour? Aye. Anyone against? We carry that. Thank you. Cheers, Kim. Thanks for coming over and thanks for clarifying some of those questions we had. No, that's fine. If you guys do have any further ones, just let me know and I'll yes. through. Yeah, well, we'll be hearing from you about the day. Yes. And I'll let the team know when uh, we, we get that approval. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Uh, Chair's report. So, uh, my report um, is published. Has anyone got any questions or things that they would like to add or any other comments uh, to bring up? Part of the chair's report. I was noted, Cody. Yeah, it's been a busy month, and that's why we need you to report on yes. it, Cody, because it shows how much the community board is engaging with the community, and that is why. If it had been a quiet month, then yes, so I'm out spreading the good news. We need to uh, <laughs> memorialize it in the chair's report. Totally. Other question, uh, Lock? Yeah, just, yeah, I just apologize. I, the Mount Kadrona Station development, uh, opening, um, I don't know, must have missed the invite or didn't see it advertised. Um, oh, yeah. oh, well, 
So Chris was there. Was there. Not Linda, Linda was there. Oh, I was there. Linda was... didn't get an invitation. She got it via me. So <laughs> I don't know that it, it went to everybody. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, no, it's a small little thing. That's the sort of thing I, you know, I, I don't you know that this week thing. I do. If anybody knows about things like that, I don't know why. Well, yeah, for this weekend is the snow farm uh, yeah, yeah, opening there. Yeah, I heard about that yesterday. Is it Helen Clark? Is it the one Helen Clark? Oh, no, I see. I've got to invite to that one. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the other one was just as Barry got any update or clarification on his comment about working on crossing or something in three parts. Or was he said Barry? Uh, um, uh, well, John and I have been working with the um, mm. um, TK school. Yep. Okay. Uh, there are concerns that, uh, that there is going to be a huge catchment uh, of pupils um, travelling from the Orchard Road, Valentine Road area. Uh, we had a bit of a tally up. It looks like it could be up towards a thousand dwellings uh, projected to be uh, built in that area. Um, and obviously the, the school is uh, keen to investigate travel pathways for the pupils to be able to make their way to school independently in the safest way possible. I had some discussions with um, Ken and uh, we were going to get together at some point with one of the roading guys and, and look at possibilities. Um, I had a chat with the one of the developers, there is plans to have another roundabout Beside the at the class harvester uh, place, oh, on. Yeah. like Enterprise Drive and uh, yeah, you know, between the Enterprise the Drive and on. Riverbank Road, mm -hmm. it's going to be a, a, a roundabout constructed there because that is going to be one of the main access points into that future housing area. Because it's that's like near the dog pound, just be. yes, before the uh, up on top of the hill. Yeah. So you're going to say the Riverbank Road. Uh, currently in construction roundabout is yeah. going to have another roundabout really really close just up on that rise yeah, beside that rise. just on the boundary of enterprise the industrial park yes is that going to be just a three-way it won't go into three part it won't cut through into so it'll yeah. just be a three-way three three effectively three um well, where's the fourth be going into the industrial area on the top on the, on the top side on the, on, the, on, the, on the central machine high side yeah it's going to be industrial yeah. okay oh. So, so yeah, you're just going to be so yeah, yeah, because because we are going to be segregated. The, you know that catchment for uh, the zoning for the primary school is in Valentine Road, which is going to get busier and busier. There is a yeah, that, that's the concern for the school, isn't it? Getting across that Valentine Road at, 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 at number of points along Valentine Road as well, it's right up well, to sort of. Gordon. It's limited from that uh, river, uh, Valentine Road, Orchard Road, Riverbank Road area. There's limited access to uh, come out on Valentine Road. There's no direct access uh, roadwise through into Frederick Street or Gordon Road. So uh, really, the bulk of the traffic is going to be coming out of the proposed road beside Class Harvester uh, onto that roundabout, and then of course it's a matter of getting the angle in. Well, is Gordon Road punching through? Yes, that's what I missed. Yeah, that's what uh, this has raised a really good point. That the urgency for us to have the uh, traffic. <laughs> transport guys over here we need to look at this because we need to look at the master plan for three parks there's two more entrances coming on riverbank road into three parks there's an entrance off golf course road going into three parks there's Gordon road going into three parks and we just talked about class we pembroke terraces are being busy doing their roading and paths at the moment there's a disconnect because we haven't got a road from pedrona valley road through but they're putting aside land it's up to be up to the gordon family to agree to approval a road but in the meantime even just trying to get uh, active travel through there is so important but until we sit down with the transport people with a picture of it all this there and identify what's already in master plans and what isn't so that then we can push for the connections to the schools the crossing yeah. points yeah. look at three parks see whether in the center of three parks where the cycle lanes is more important there than flush medians all these things need to be discussed and we're doing it ad hoc at the moment and I strongly, you know, I know you're pushing to get them here to do it, but we really need to have the board involved in uh, this basically a strategy or plan that's taking the place of whatever the optimization we're being got to. Sorry, I, no, I, it's just such an important issue, right? It there. is, it is, yeah, because, uh, because our successors will look back and say, well, What on earth are you guys slip at the wheel around and the that, little crowd? And, and that particular block, 
beyond the Fly Golf Course Road, Riverbank Road, and Valentine is probably the worst piece of urban planning in our entire district. So we need to look at what they've got there now, what, what they're doing, because they're trying to connect up and do enterprise drive. They're trying to, you know, we've got down the road going through and Frederick Street, it's just, but until we sit down and see what the latest developers are doing. Yeah. I've got, I got a semi Sorry, question. John. No, 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 just, no, this no. just really brings back us to the single stage business case that really should be looking at, that, that's been long delayed, is theoretically underway. This is a key area that that should be looking at. The whole picture of tra transport, active transport, all those links. And I really am concerned that this seems to be going nowhere at the moment. Barry, what's the suggestion? Who do you think we would need to get a workshop, I think, to get some observation? I don't think it's just a presentation at a community board meeting. It's, it's deeper than that. No, it's a major issue. And, and I think, you know, it's good that we've identified it at this stage, but there are some historical lacks of linkages from potentially one of the bigger housing areas uh, to get to the key points in, in town, particularly the schools and the uh, sports facilities and so forth. So, uh, yeah, I think it's worthy of perhaps establishing um, a, a working party yeah. within the, the the board to to work with uh, the the traffic people, uh, traffic management, roading people, to and the developers to look at maximising the the opportunities that that they are left and they are limited. So we need to we need to yeah yeah they're closing all the time. And, and is this a plan? Can I ask why this wasn't pulled up? Why this wasn't captured in the, the planning of it. I mean, I don't want to put fingers, but is it, it's now getting to a traffic thing, but surely it should have been a planning. Well, this is my point, but it's been ad hoc that um, every subdivision within that block has been dealt with independently. Okay. There's no, um, yeah, and then the There's no market plan for that, that, that block because there's so many different the landowners who, with three parks, there is no market plan. You have a single landowner who enables that. North Lake, you've got a single landowner yep. developer who's enabled that, where this is being dealt with by, you know, eight or nine different landowners, and it's a mess. Um, you yeah, right down to the pipes and um, and things, not just the roads. It's um, <clears throat> anyway, we can do better. Okay, I will organise a briefing from the. PNI transport team and PNI and have that as a workshop and they think from that workshop when we're all part of it we can then go and say is there a working party that's going to take this that take this forward um, I will maybe with Ken's help make sure that that happens you know as soon as possible because the problems are only getting exacerbated every time there's decisions made around that so well, I think she would know this um, yes the party's quite a in every work um, John and Barry, recent recent times on that school concern yes, yes. and connect. And then, as you rightly pointed out, Valentine Road to the energy. A lot of the credit come through it on the basis of what we've just covered off. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll work with Ken on that and then we'll get a date in the diary and get everyone briefed. Uh, and, and and then yeah, put together a team to, to, to continue this. It's not going to get solved with one meeting, obviously. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks for raising that, uh, Lyle and Barry, for, for making this happen. Anything else around the Chair's report you'd like to add? This afternoon, I am doing a 45-minute presentation to U3A on the Wanaka Arts and Cultural Trust mm -hmm. Performing Arts Centre. Mm, very good. Very good. So I think Mr. Luxton referred to as Boondoggle Projects last night. <laughs> 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 It doesn't sound like that's base, back to basics. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. But, um, yeah, it's... A, it's I think um, the, the, the trust has realistic expectations of where this is going in terms of its time. Right. Well, yeah. nicely put. Anything else? Okay. Well, the, the report's here to be read, and I appreciate everyone's engagement over the previous six weeks and for highlighting that in the report. So, as it's my report, I will move that uh, the contents of the chair's report uh, be accepted and that they'll note it and accepted. Uh, anyone like to second that? Sure. Thank you, John. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. We'll carry that. Time is 11.04, and I will be closing the meeting uh, in a second, and we'll be moving on to a workshop with Fiona Roberts, Fee Roberts from Police, who's coming to meet with us, and Glenn Peake from the uh, Chamber of Commerce. So stick around for that. Uh, meeting closed at 11.04. Thank you, everybody.